Well, good morning. Sorry. I wouldn't turn on there for a second. <laughs> good morning. Welcome to you who are joining us here on site, but also those who are joining us online this morning. Yes, this is the final week of our series called Piecing It Together. As we're looking at God's plan for marriage, as it's, it's, it's so succinctly declared in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. And, and as we come to the end, today we're going to be talking about cleaving. Now, that word cleaving or cleave is not one that we use very often unless perhaps you're in the kitchen and you've grabbed kind of a big square butcher's knife, like a cleaver, to cut a chunk of meat or something, to, to cut something apart. But if you've been with us through the previous weeks, it might sound kind of odd that as we're piecing God's plan for marriage together, we get to the last week and it's like, let's just chop that up now. So uh, there might be something else going on here with this particular word. See, the word cleave is actually what's referred to as a contronym or a, or a Janus word. Any English majors with us today? A couple. Yeah, I figured this. Yeah, I know Athena's got one. Yeah, Athena's got, yeah, Athena's got a, like a degree in everything. So, <laughs> she, yeah. Maybe this year during Pastor 411 we'll do an episode of, of you know, uh, fabulous things about Athena again and all the things that she's done. But, yes, those, these contronyms, these Janus words, and basically what it is, is there's these words in English language that makes English so hard to learn, where one word will have two contradictory meanings, and they're both, they're both valid. Uh, and cleave is one of those. But I'll give you some other examples. For example, the word dust. If you were to dust something, you would, you would clean small particles of dust off your furniture. You would be taking particles off. But if you were to dust a plate of strawberries, you'd be adding fine particles of sugar to the strawberries, right? Well, which one is it? Are we dusting or are we dusting? Uh, the word oversight is another one. Mom may be looking after, may, mom may be giving oversight to making sure the kids have a healthy lunch, where a dad gets too busy playing with the kids and lunch becomes an oversight that he misses. So again, which is it? Are we oversight or oversight? And of course, there's the phrase government oversight, which we'll leave that one aside for another day. <laughs> we want to apply that one. But the word cleave is one of these types of words. It can mean to cut apart with a cleaver, but it can also mean to stick together like glue. To stick together like glue. And we actually see an example of this in Jesus' teaching. Uh, we actually see kind of this dual meaning come up in one of Jesus' conversations he has. And he actually applies it to marriage. He applies it to marriage. And it's found in Matthew chapter 19. I don't know if you want to flip there in your own Bibles or if you want to use a pew Bible. It's on page 800. Uh, we also have all the sermon notes on our uh, sermon notes online through the pew portal. So I'll give you a second to find those if you like. But while you're finding Matthew 19, if you want to follow along for a few minutes here, we find this part of Scripture where Jesus is being questioned by some Pharisees. And they come to Jesus to ask him a question about an issue that has social and religious significance. It's kind of a religious and social hot potato they bring to him. And it's the topic of divorce. In the question they ask him, we see in Matthew chapter 19, they ask him, Jesus, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Now, the reason they're asking him this question is because there were two prevailing areas of thought of the day in which they asked it. Both sides, or both answers believed it was lawful for a man to divorce his wife, but they had different reasons for it. See, one, one group said you could lawfully divorce your wife, but only in significant cases of immorality. Significant immorality was the only reason that was lawful. But there was another group of, of, of Jewish people, another group of religious leaders who said, no, you, you can divorce your wife for any reason. You basically need to say divorce, divorce, divorce like three times and hand her a piece of paper and it's done. And so this is the situation that Jesus is thrust into. And their goal is they're hoping they can get Jesus to say that it's okay to cleave a marriage and in doing so to pick one side over the other. Because if they can get him to pick one side over the other, then that puts him at odds with at least half the people who love him. And they might even be able to get him to contradict God's law in the process, which work out really, really well for them. But here's how he answers them. He says, haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the creator made them male and female. And he said, and here, here's, our, here's our verse from Genesis 2.24. He, he said, for this reason a man will leave his father and his mother and be united to his wife. That was week one, wasn't it, when we talked about leaving, about how we need to make space in our lives so that we can make space on that chair beside us. Remember the stools, and Nadine came and sat in the stool beside me as we make space from past loyalties to make space to reorganize those priorities so that the one right beside us is our spouse. There's a closest relationship we have next to our relationship with God. 
We have to leave things from the past. And then, and then he continues is, so they'll leave their father and mother and be united to his wife. That's what we talked about the last two weeks, wasn't it? This idea of, of weaving, of uniting our lives together to create a shared story. And the story that we're creating has all these different chapters, right? It has, it, it has some romance and it's, it's got some comedy. But as we learned last week, we talked about conflict. It's also got some action and adventure that are written into the story as well. The weaving, the, the leaving, the weaving. And then as he continues, he says, and then the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but they are one. They will cleave. It's this description of marital intimacy. The two joining together in body, in mind, and in spirit. As this beautiful, incredible expression in experience of love that leaves absolutely no room for any other. Because they are cleaved together. And then Jesus drives his point home to their question in this final statement where he affirms God's heart for marriage and he says this. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Therefore, what God has cleaved, let no one cleave. What God has cleaved, let no one cleave. See, marriage is not this human institution that we've created for ourselves that we can, we can move in and out of freely. Marriage is this beautiful gift of God. It's this beautiful gift of God where it's actually a way, it's a way in which every day of our lives we can have a taste of his love for us, experience within the union of marriage. It's a way that we can experience, be bound together and get a taste of the unity that he experiences, invites us to experience. It's this, it's this living metaphor of his relationship with us. And when we understand that we cleave together in this fashion, that means that when things don't go right, we don't just cut and run. We talk and we pray through it together. It means that when life gets hard, we're, we're not allowing the things of this world, the stresses to tear us apart, but to bind us together in that commitment that we've made. You see, cleaving is this idea about protecting. It's about, about honoring what God has cleaved together so that we would not be cleaved apart. Does that make sense? And so as we conclude our discussion on marriage today, it's my prayer that, that we will be reminded, and maybe we'll even be renewed, in our desire for, for this marital intimacy that's being discussed. This idea of this marital intimacy being discussed, so that regardless of what we face in life that may threaten to cleave us apart, the power and the presence of God may cleave us together. Amen? So now I use that word intimacy a minute ago. And it's a critical word for us to understand. It's actually a word we're going to focus on the rest of our time today. This idea of intimacy is, is so critically related to the idea of the two becoming one flesh. And we experience intimacy in a few ways in our lives, don't we? There's, there's what we can refer to as relational intimacy, where we have like, like our best friend. We've got our bestie, and there's this relational intimacy that we experience with another person. But sometimes we hear the word intimacy, and a lot of our minds will go to physical intimacy, where we will have an intimate relationship, a physically intimate relationship with another person, we'll say sometimes. But then we also can have emotional intimacy, where there are certain emotions, certain feelings, fears, and joys, and hopes, and, 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 and these things that happen inside of us that we will only share with certain people. There's, you could also say, you know, there's emotional intimacy. There's, there's only one person in this world who can make me cry, or, or something like that, because you have this emotional intimate connection with them. But whether we're talking about physical, emotional, re relational, or other types of intimacy, here's something they all hold in common. This helps us to define the word intimacy. It's that intimacy is this idea of sharing a part of yourself with another that is limited or exclusively reserved for them. Sharing something of yourself that is exclusively reserved for them. For that person who's on the stool beside you, that person that you've left other loyalties to make space for, to build trust with, to, to weave your life with, that person, your spouse, is the one you cleave to by exclusively sharing parts of yourself with them. And, and, and we know, whether in your own life or from maybe stories of other examples, perhaps you've seen other people's marriages, that when that happens, there, there's something inside of us, there's this, this feeling, this deep longing inside of us that gets satisfied. That otherwise leaves us empty and searching for something. And in addition to that, what happens is we end up actually being better equipped 
to navigate life together. Like cleaving together, we're actually able to better navigate life together. And, and we read about this in the Old Testament in the words of wisdom that are, that are found in Ecclesiastes chapter 4. You, you may have been to a wedding or may, may even have had a wedding where this was read, this passage from Ecclesiastes 4 verses 9 through 12 that talks about this, this idea of being better equipped together, cleaving together to navigate life. And here's what it says. It says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But, but pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they'll keep warm. But, but how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can fend themselves. And a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. This beautiful passage talks about how when we invest in another person, there's a return that we experience. There's a good return for that investment when we invest in another person. How our journey in life can be more enjoyable and it can be more fruitful. It also talks here about when we experience hard times. You know those moments when we, when we misstep, when we stumble in our lives and we, we kind of feel like we've fallen on our faces a little bit? It's in those times that we have this person who comes along not to extend a pointed finger, but to extend a helping hand and to help us up and pity the one who doesn't have that. And it talks here about when you feel alone and, and, and when you feel like you're down. You have someone to come along and offer a hug, a comforting, to, to warm you physically and to encourage you physically, but also an encouraging word to warm your heart as well. But then we get to verse 12. And in kind of a summary statement of what's being discussed here about this idea of what happens when two become one. The summary statement about what happens when we cleave when we know that another person has our back, when we know that another person is there and helping to equip us to endure more in life, that we can do more together than apart. That's, that's that relational, that's that, that physical, that's that emotional intimacy we're talking about. But then it adds one more line, doesn't it? It talks, it, it talks here about the one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. But then it goes on to say, but a third chord, when our duo becomes a trio, now, didn't I just say a minute ago, intimacy is, is exclusive. It's like the, the kind of the smaller the circle, the more intimate it is, right? But how can a duo become a trio and increase intimacy? Well, in this case, it depends on who that third is. And it's speaking here about that third chord being God. That as we weave God into our story, we can also weave him into our marriage. And when that happens... When God is woven into our lives and then woven into the story of our marriage, when that happens... We start to experience something we can refer to as spiritual intimacy. Spiritual intimacy. Remember what intimacy is, right? Intimacy is this exclusively sharing parts of yourself with another. And we're familiar with the idea of emotional and, and physical and relational intimacy. We just talked about those. But I know, I, I know that we're much less familiar with this idea of spiritual intimacy. Isn't that true? Of spiritual intimacy. We may have heard of it. But we're curious if we can define it. And we're not sure if we've experienced it. But we know it's this, that there's this thing called spiritual intimacy. And I found in the years that I've been a pastor working with couples, you know, through, through marriage preparation and then, and then the, the many, many weddings that I've done. And then and the many counseling sessions I've had with couples throughout the years of being a pastor. I, I know that this is something that people are aware of, but it's neglected. It's so often neglected. And that's in part because it's, it's intimate. See, when we talk about spiritual intimacy, what we're talking about here is this idea that, that we are inviting our spouse in. We're inviting our spouse in to see and to experience the good and the bad of how we relate to God. Because we have this relationship with God, right? And, and, and sometimes we're like, oh, it's, it's, it's me and God. And, and it's just the two of us. And I don't really want someone else to see that because sometimes it's not very pretty. Sometimes I'm not as faithful as he is. Sometimes I'm not as good as we just sang he is. And I'm not sure I want a, a, an audience, even an audience of one, to observe that. But spiritual intimacy invites. It invites another person to come in and to experience this. To, to be able to view it. And I'm not, I'm not just talking about having your, your spouse uh, just sort of attend church with you. 
uh, about having your spouse see you, you know, raise your hands during worship songs. Uh, I'm not just talking about having your spouse see you and observe you praying at your life group and volunteering in kids' ministry. Those are all ways that kind of fit into this idea of spiritual intimacy. But I'm not just talking about that because that's not that exclusive, is it? There's a few hundred people here who just saw you attend church and raise your hands and and. When you're a group, there's a dozen people in your home group who see you pray. That, that's part of it. That's what I'm talking about. I, I mean, when you grant access to your partner to, to understand your doubts and your fears, when you have somebody you can talk to about those things in a safe place, when you invite somebody to praise God in the victories of your life, when you have a moment of praise where you want to thank God, uh, apart from thanking God, who is the next person you think that you want to share that with? Your spouse. And you bring them into that praise with you. And maybe you even invite them into praying the hard things. The private prayers that, that really would not get shared with very many people. And then they reciprocate this back. They grant you access to see this in their lives as well. And when this takes place, we, we start to experience an even greater understanding of intimacy. Because as we have a relationship with God and we invite our spouse to share in that with us together, God binds that together. And so that what God has cleaved together, we can say, let no one cleave apart. And I'm willing to bet. I'm willing to bet from experience, from, from my own personal testimony, but, but also just from understanding this concept. I'm willing to bet that the list of people in your life who know you in this way is pretty small. True. It's a pretty small number of people who have experienced those things in you and about you. But here's what I want you to know. I want you to know that there is incredible blessing in cleaving as a cord of three strands so that life will not cleave you. See what I mean? There's incredible blessing in cleaving as three strands so that life will not cleave you. And part of the reason that that number is so limited on who experiences that is, one, because of the definition of intimacy, you know, it's a small group. Uh, it may be so intimate that you would say there's like zero people who, who know me that well. That's a pretty exclusive group, a group of zero, isn't it? But I think there's other reasons, not just the fact that it's an intimate thing to share. But there's a few other obstacles that I, I think get in our way. And there's power in understanding these obstacles. Because if we know what they are, if we put language to what they are, we can maybe navigate around them. And so one of the first obstacles people find when they're struggling or, or not sure about marital intimacy is this one. They, well, they're not even aware that it's a thing. Right? There are some people who don't even know that marital intimacy is something, uh, spiritual intimacy in marriage is something they should be striving to achieve. That when you think about your relationship with God, you think well, it's, 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 it's me and he. This concept has never entered your mind that it could be we and he. It, no, it's me and he. There's no we and he, it's me and he. But this idea of there being a we in there opens our eyes to something that's possible. And we can go back to Genesis chapter 2. When it's just, it's just Adam and God. It's just, you know, it's a me and he. It's just Adam and God. And God says, though, that's not good, right? It's not good for man to be alone. So he created woman. And that was good. But in the creation of woman who was made of the same stuff as Adam, as we talked about in the first week, that, that didn't mean that God stopped having a relationship with Adam simply because Eve was on the scene. Remember, she was made of the same stuff, of the same, the same nature, and so she had the ability to relate to God as well. But that didn't mean that it severed God's relationship with Adam. It means that, that they continued their relationship, and God started a relationship with Eve, and then they shared that together. As Adam would have observed how Eve interacts with God, and she would have observed how Adam interacts with God, and the result is they would have formed this triad. We see this idea that they are together in community in the beginning, in this moment of perfect community that exists. And, and this is also the context in which God declares his design for marriage. This idea that there is a strengthening of the bond through spiritual intimacy. It's not just a duo, it's a trio. And so the first thing we need to be aware of is that this is something that we should be pursuing. The second obstacle is this, is that the person you're pursuing it with has a unique spiritual experience and unique spiritual expectations than you do, completely based upon their past. Now take Nadine and I, for example. Uh, I come from a Christian home where I've been going to church longer than I can remember. 
where the things of Jesus have been discussed and displayed longer than I can remember. And that led to the fact, that led to, to me at the young age of like five years old, praying to accept Jesus into my heart. And I, you know, from five on, I had lots more to learn, obviously, but there's lots of ups and downs. But, you know, you know, but in summary statement, for my entire life, there has never been a part of my life where I haven't been aware of and in some form of relationship with Jesus. It's part of my story. That establishes a spiritual experience and spiritual expectations of how the rest of my life is going to go once I get married. Take Nadine, for example, though. Nadine comes from a much more volatile and dangerous home where nobody was a believer. And she didn't really hear or witness a true profession of the things of Christ until she was a young adult. So she has her story, and I got mine. And then the two become one flesh, right? And we marry, and we bring with us our unique experiences and our, and our, our unique relationships with Jesus, our, our unique levels of spiritual maturity and familiarity, and the two become one. How? How in the world do those two become one in practice throughout the day? You see, even in, in that situation, even if we were aware of this thing referred to as spiritual intimacy, which at the time of getting married we weren't, even if we were aware of it, how? How do we know? How do we grow? How do we show God's love jointly and equally? So like many people here, I'm going to hazard a guess, we, we tried. We received a couple's devotional as a wedding gift. We thought, well, that, that's the solution, a book. I got a book now. I'm all set, right? I got a book as a gift, and so we're going to open to page one, and our marriage is going to be bliss from this point forward. And, and so we have good intentions as we open this book and decide we're going to regularly do a couple's devotional together. We're the best couple ever. How'd that work? Anyone? Anyone? Anyone like us where it didn't work that great? Yeah, we had good intentions. We we were relatively committed to the process of the devotion. We we wanted to pray together. But it broke down pretty quick. It felt pretty forced pretty quick. It felt awkward pretty quick. And I was left thinking, where is this return on the investment I read about in Ecclesiastes 4? I'm not feeling the return on the investment. You see, so often we expect our spouse to relate to God the same way we do, but the reality is when they come together, it's more like oil and water. They don't cleave, do they? And when they don't cleave, we get frustrated. And when we get frustrated, we interpret the situation as, well, this tension we're feeling, this, this argument that seems to be caused by our devotional time, which is probably not what a devotional time is supposed to do, is probably lead to arguments. That's, that's like a different type of cleave we're trying to talk about today. When we experience that, we interpret that as we need to stop. This is not for us. And you may even feel like, well, I have this desire and need within me for this, but it's hopeless. So we just step back from it. We step back from it. If you've ever experienced that, or if you can follow the logic of that from my experience with it, it, it speaks to our third obstacle. And the third obstacle for spiritual intimacy within marriage is this. Is that not only do we have different knowledge and backgrounds and experiences, spiritual experiences with God, but we connect with God in a different way as well. We connect to God differently as well. You see, this idea of love language, who's heard of the love languages before? Probably pretty, pretty popular, right? Uh, and if you haven't heard of the love languages, you need to come to our, our class on April 12th because it's one of the things we're going to talk about. So this idea of love languages, that each person has a unique way that they show and experience love in the context of relationship. And, and there's five primary love languages. There's, there's physical touch and words of affirmation, uh, and there's quality time, you know, giving of gifts, uh, acts of service. Well, one of these five things will resonate with kind of who you are and how you best show and receive love in, in, in the context of your relationship. But this principle, this, similar to the idea of love languages, this principle actually can be applied to how we experience God. And, and Gary Chapman, you probably heard of the name Gary Chapman at some point, he wrote a book called Sacred Pathways. And in this book, Sacred Pathways, he, he summarizes the purpose of this book by saying, we need to let go of our one-size-fits-all spirituality and discover a path of worship that frees you to be you. 
Now, this isn't a book about multiple ways to salvation. This, this isn't a book about multiple ways to having the right relationship with God. We know from John 14 that Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only life, right? Right. And so Jesus is the only way to salvation. Jesus is the only way to right relationship with God. That's not what this book is about. With that as the foundation, Gary Chapman then says, maybe there's different ways that we relate to him, though. Maybe, maybe we relate to him in different ways. And, that, and that's what understanding this third obstacle is about, is that we have different pathways to how we worship God. We all come to God the same way through Jesus Christ. But then how we grow and how we experience him, how we worship him, how we, how we can cleave together one another with him it can be unique a bit. And it begins by becoming aware of and understanding the beautiful uniquenesses of how God created you. And we know that this is true from Psalm 139. It says, that the psalmist says, God, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are too wonderful. I know that full well. And this idea of being fearfully and wonderfully made, we see it in the amazing makeup of our bodies. When, I don't know how you, we can study biology and physiology and not just be blown away with the amazing miracle of God that we find in creation. We were fearfully and wonderfully made in our bodies. But also how God has uniquely created us with personalities and and abilities and and opportunities to use those for his purposes. And and it's so beautiful how we've been created to experience God. It extends to that as well. And so some of the pathways that he talked about in here, for example, let's give you a couple of them. For example, he'll talk about some people, some people worship and relate to God best through, uh, through an intellectual pathway. Through using their minds, they, they just love to study and, and dive deep into scripture and commentaries and books. If you're not one of those, you, that, it's like, a how? How could you worship God in that fashion? But if, but if that's who you are, you're like, yes, that, that's, that's when I feel closest to God. There are others who are naturalists, the, the ones that I don't understand. I don't understand these naturalists. They experience God through nature. I, I remember I'm like what you call indoorsy, and, and, and these people who go outdoorsy, and, and they, they just go out to nature, and they're like, I just, I hike, and I, and I climb, and I just walk through a meadow, and I can feel the grass and the flowers on my fingertips, and it's like a spiritual experience for me. Then there's enthusiasts, people who draw near to God through like expressive celebration and worship, people who come to to church services like this, or they're driving in their cars, and, and it's like you're honking at them because they're stuck at their red light because they're eyes closed, hands up, praising God at the red light, and you're like, come on, let's get going. But, but they're enthusiasts. They're, they're having a spiritual moment at that red light, right? Uh, and there's caregivers, people who experience the closest to God through caring and serving other people. There, there, there's, there's other ones in there, but you kind of get the idea that there's all these different pathways that, that have scripture, uh, scriptural, biblical basis for each of them and, and can draw a person into a closer relationship with God. But how does this apply to our marriage? Well, some people will be thinking about these different ideas, I, these examples I already gave you, and going, yeah, that, that, that's me. I'm, I'm the intellect, or I'm, I'm the naturalist, and, and I can see my spouse as the enthusiast, or my spouse as the caregiver. There's nine pathways in all that he covers in this book. And, and where it begins, where we begin in the marriage is understanding what each of us is. Because then we can figure out how do we bring that together. See, for me, for example, I'm a contemplative intellect. My top two are contemplation and intellect. And so I draw close to God through, like, scholarship. I love to learn. I I love to open the Bible and open books and do research and learn about God and about theology. And then I'm always taking it to the process of, of, well, why? Why that? And, And so what? Like, what do we do with that? And the way that I grow in my relationship with God best is, and, and kind of grow spiritually myself is through reason and knowledge, discussions, um, uh, theological philosophy, uh, and, and pragmatism. Like, like, just like putting it into practice. So that's, that's, that's me. But then there's Nadine. Where Nadine is a contemplative ascetic. She draws close to God. You know, she has a contemplative part like I do. And so she, she has that aspect of personal adoration and, and personal feelings of devotion. We share that, but she also has the aesthetic aspect, which means that she feels closest to God in moments of solitude and simplicity, where she's given time alone with her own thoughts, and she can just kind of process, maybe prayerfully process what she's learning and experiencing. Now, we have some similarities, we have some differences. 
But the differences are big enough that you can't just draw us together and sit down and do a Bible study. We can't just sit down, open the Bible, do a Bible study, pray, and be done. We can't. We've tried it. It didn't work. It didn't work because we're bad people. It worked because God created us differently. We have different approaches to how do we approach that task. You see, we both share this contemplative aspect. We both have this adoration and this sense of devotion. We both have this desire to do this and to do it in an expressive way. We share that. But remember, mine is the intellectual one. My, I like to discuss and debate and wrestle with scriptures and wrestle with theology. Nadine, she likes time to process. She likes to step back and process quietly herself. And so when I read scripture and I'm like, this is what it means, and, and, but this and this equals this, then how do you get to this? And I'm waiting for an answer. And she stares at me blankly. Silence. I'm like, are you, are you with me? Like, are we doing this together or what? It's, uh, the problem isn't me and the problem isn't her. The problem is the way that we are trying to approach it. Is this making sense? The way we're trying to approach it. The solution, we can pick something to study together. We, we can get, we get dust off the book from when we got married almost 30 years ago. We could pick that book if we wanted to. We could, we could simply open the Bible if we wanted to. But we need to decide what we're going to study and then we need to go away on our own. And I can dig into it. And I, I can wrestle with it on my own. And, and she can go process it. And then later, after she's had time to process and I've had time to research, then we come together. And now we've got something to talk about. Now we've got something to talk about. But we also have to be aware that if it's going to get a couple steps further along, I have to be allowed to research and she has to be allowed to step back. And then we come back together and we talk about it. You see, there wasn't a bad process, and there wasn't bad intentions, and there weren't bad people involved. It's that we needed to understand, and we needed to honor and respect who we were. And by first understanding who we were and how God has beautifully and fearfully made us, once we know what that looks like, we can then say, okay, well, how does this and this come together to form this? Does that make sense? You see, we can't just take who I am and who she is and just try and cram it together in some sort of hybrid model because we have good intentions. God's uniquely and beautifully created us. And there is a solution where you and your spouse, if you've wrestled with this in the past, if, if this has been an area of conflict and challenge for you, I'd encourage you not to give up and not to feel hopeless, but to step back. And say, step back and let's begin by understanding, what, tell me your spiritual story and I'll tell you mine. Uh, tell me what, what, model, what was modeled for you spiritually in your background, I'll tell you what was modeled for me. What, what are you expecting to get out of these moments together? What am I expecting to get out of them? And then let's dig into how did God create you to experience this and how did he create me to experience this. And once we, even that conversation itself, which is probably a few conversations, even that conversation is an intimate conversation that will relationally and emotionally bind you together. And then we can start to form a practice, a practice of doing this. And, and so as I'm talking about this, I, I'm going to hazard a bet that some of you have maybe heard of some of this before. Uh, some of you have not, but most of you are probably interested and, and, and say, what is my pathway? And, what is my spouse's pathway? And if we know what those are, what is possible for us now? And so I want you to know, if you're, if you're looking at the sermon notes online right now, there's a link right there in the sermon notes to take you to a little, a little two-page assessment on how you can fill in some, you know, we've all done this before, these little assessments. It'll help to identify what your pathway is. If you're not on the sermon notes right now, if you're part of our Beyond the Message groups, there's a link in the Beyond the Message questions for you. And if you're not part of either of those, well, you should be, but if you're not, there's some printed out versions at the welcome desk that you can grab after the service if you want to go through that yourself. But I also want to encourage you to check that out, but also let me know if you need any help or if there's anything we can do to help you understand these things better. And this is good for everybody. This is good for all people who are married. It's good for all people who are single. And it's really good if we are in a relationship and we can find these things out and then talk about it. And the reason being is because I know, I know this as well, as, as I close with this, is that if I asked 100 couples today, do you and your spouse connect spiritually? Like, are you woven together and cleaving together spiritually in that fashion? I know for a fact a majority of you would say no, but we should. No, but we should. Because you have the desire to, and you want to, but sometimes the past history of how you've done it and knowledge on how to even start is what has gotten in your way. Now, if you are one of those people where you have found a way to make this work, that, that's a beautiful thing. That's amazing, and we need to learn from you. 
So share that with people in your lives on how you've done it so they can learn from you. And for those of us who can learn from those who have done it well, I, I know some of the things that you would teach us. As you shared your story with us, you would tell us things like, well, at first it didn't happen overnight, okay? It did not happen overnight. It was hard at the start. I'm sure those who are making this happen for themselves now would say it was, it was hard at the start. It was really tough. We, we weren't sure we were going to be able to keep this as a regular discipline of our, of our spiritual life together. But the way that we did it, you would tell us, is that we kept it simple. We decided we're going to, we're going to read scripture, we're going, to, we're going to meditate, we're going to pray, but we're going to do it in a way that matches who God created us to be. And so it was hard at first, and, and, and it took a struggle and took some real commitment, but, but we understood who we were, and so we chose to keep it simple by, by reading and meditating and just praying together. And then we set realistic goals. We set realistic goals about how often we're going to do this, about you know, what sort of a schedule does it look like? What does it fit your schedule and my schedule best to, to put this in the schedule? What sort of frequency do we think we could do this with that we would actually have some degree of success and, and not just keep kind of bumping and bumping and bumping the time together? And, and then you would probably also tell us if you're having success in this, not only did you keep it simple and not only was it hard at start, but you, you scheduled it and you kept at it. You'd also tell us that you slipped up sometimes, I think you would probably say. You say there were moments when we, we'd have runs where it went really well, but then we just kind of life happened. And it just kind of fell off the schedule. We slipped up. But then we extended that helping hand and we helped each other up. And we got back at it. And we kept working at it. We celebrated the successes. We encouraged each other. We did it together. And it finally became a habit. A habit that we experience in our lives. And now now we do it. And now we are experiencing the benefits of spiritual intimacy as we are cleaving even closer together than we ever thought possible. As we're experiencing what, 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 what Paul writes in Philemon 1.6 when he says this, and this is my prayer for you as well, when he says that I pray that your partnership in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing that we share for the sake of Jesus Christ. I, pr- I pray that for you. I pray that through your partnership in the context of your most intimate relationships with, with your spouse, with God, As you share in the partnership of that faith, you would experience this deepening of your understanding of what is available to you in Jesus Christ. And as you experience that, that you'll be able to watch and to learn one another, the most intimate relationship, that being the relationship with God. And that that would allow you to learn about your spouse. That would allow you to to help them and and to encourage them in their walk with Jesus and and that walk they have with God on their own. But also it would reveal the sacred pathway that you can join them in that walk. That if we could experience these things, it would also teach us not just about our partner and their relationship with God. It would also teach us about God. It it would show us an even more diverse way that he speaks and how he moves. We know how it happens in our lives, but we would have a glimpse into how it happens in somebody else's lives. And it expands our understanding of God as we see how he speaks and how he moves and how he relates in different ways than we're familiar with. And then we could see God work. We could see God move in our lives. And we could experience these God moments together. See, spiritual intimacy has this amazing ability to cleave us together as a resilient cord of three so that we can stand against anything in this world that would seek to cleave us apart. And so as we close our marriage series, I I, I truly hope that this time has been an encouragement. I hope it's been a challenge for many of us. And I hope that you feel a sense of blessing. The fact that, and not just from my words, but, but from the fact that God gave marriage as a gift As a marriage is a gift that is to be rewarding and fulfilling and to draw us closer to him as as we understand what it means to leave and to weave and to cleave. I just want to close with a word of prayer and say that I I hope we will choose to not only make Jesus the center of our lives, but also that we'll make him the center of our marriages, that he may bind us together. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we we thank you for this topic, for for the truth of your word, for the relevance of your word of how the spirit that, that exists within us and around us is, is, not just, is, is not just here, as amazing as it is, to draw us into a relationship with you, Lord. And we thank you for that. And I pray for any here who, who, who do not have that relationship with you, who do not know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, that they would feel that longing within them now and to, and to step forward and come speak with me after the service so we can talk more about that. But we thank you, Lord, that, 
that your spirit not only exists to draw us closer to you in that fashion, but, Lord, you also want to unite us into this deep spiritual bond with the one that you've given us as a life partner. And so for those of us, the many, many of us here who are married and preparing to be married, Lord, I pray that you would be at the heart, not only of our lives, but of our homes and our marriages, that you would help to cleave us together so that nothing in this world would cleave us apart. And Lord, may that be a great witness and testimony to your power, to your greatness, and to your glory in the world around us, we pray. Amen.